Hello there, good evening ladies and gentlemen, this is Al24 News, streaming live from the capital Algiers and coming up next in our news program. European leaders pledge unity in their goal of averting war on the continent, as France President Emmanuel Macron has stated that there is a potential for another solution. U.S. President Joe Biden's nominee to be the top U.S. military general for the Middle East, Michael Corella expressed his concerns over what he sees as a strong growth for the so-called ISIL and Al-Qaeda. Sri Lanka health workers launched an indefinite strike protesting the government's failure to address salary anomalies and other issues. Thousands of Argentines marched through the streets of Buenos Aires to protest against a likely deal with the International Monetary Fund to revamp more than $40 billion of debt that the country cannot pay back. Hello again and welcome to Al24 World Latest, conducting an urgent round of marathon diplomacy between Moscow and Kiev, French President Emmanuel Macron says he saw concrete solutions to his intentions with Russia over Ukraine. Macron has talks with Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev a day after a five hours meeting at the Kremlin with Russia's Vladimir Putin as the West scrambled to defuse fears Moscow could invade its ex-Soviet neighbor. French President Emmanuel Macron has said that Russian President Vladimir Putin told him in their marathon talks a day earlier that Moscow would not further escalate the Ukrainian crisis. Macron's remarks on a visit to Kiev Tuesday came as the Kremlin denied that he and Putin struck a deal on the escalating the crisis. He told me that he will not start an escalation. This morning, we had a confirmation of that promise. I believe that we have concrete, practical solutions that will allow us to move forward. We have had the opportunity to discuss this together. I have also had the opportunity to discuss this with President Putin, as I have done with my European partners and several of our allies. But by the same token, I do not believe that this crisis can be resolved by a few hours of discussion. Volodymyr Zelensky, on the other hand, expressed his skepticism about the ability of Europeans to put any pressure on Russia to deoccupy Ukraine. I do not trust words in general. Every politician's sincerity appears in their actions. In our case, the sincerity is the escalation. I believe that Putin needs to do the same, especially that he's a very sincere person, as I understand. I do not know any entity in Europe that would be able to put strong pressure on Russia. The occupation of our country is still not happening. For its part, the U.S. president and the German chancellor expressed their common views in Washington in the crisis around Ukraine, but still failed to speak with the same voice on the highly controversial Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. Thank you for having me here. Really, I appreciate very much that we have the chance to discuss all the topics you raise. They are very important. We are closest allies and we are working intensely together and this is necessary for doing the steps that we have to do for it, fighting against Russian aggression against Ukraine. So it's an important meeting at a very, very important time. These meetings come amid mounting fears of a Russian invasion. Moscow has massed tens of thousands of troops and military hardware near the border with Ukraine, but insists it has no plans to attack its neighbor. Iran has unveiled a new missile with a reported range that would allow it to reach both U.S. bases in the region as well as targets inside Archful Zionist entity. The state TV reported that the missile has solid fuel and a range of 1,450 kilometers it is called the Khyber Buster, a reference to Jewish castle overrun by Muslim warriors in the early days of Islam. A Syrian soldier has been killed and five others were wounded in a Zionist occupation attack near the capital Damascus. Today, Wednesday, according to a statement by the Syrian Ministry of Defense, 
Syrian air defense media responded to the aggression with surface-to-surface -surface missile directed from the occupied Syrian Golan. U.S. President Joe Biden's nominee to be the top U.S. military general for the Middle East, Michael Carilla, expressed his concern over what he sees as a strong growth for the so-called ISIL and Al-Qaeda. This comes a few weeks after the U.S. troops went into a battle with the group members to retake control of the prison that's been seized. Nabi Khazini on what follow. On Tuesday, the American army headed in force to a Syrian prison. The American forces fought the so-called ISIL for a control of a prison in northeastern Syria. This represented the most substantial military engagement with the group since it lost the last of its territory in 2019. Reports indicate that up to 200 fighters may have escaped and hundreds of people were killed. <laughs> if you are confirmed, you will be responsible for helping ensure the SDF and the Iraqi government have the capacity and support needed to address the threat from ISIS and properly detain these prisoners. U.S. CENTCOM Commander nominee Lieutenant General Mishael Kurella commented on the event saying that part of the world is still unsafe. CENTCOM theater is also burdened by civil war and humanitarian crisis. The area is home to nine of the top ten most dangerous violent extremist organizations including Al-Qaeda and ISIS which are both reconstituting. All of these ill trends are accelerated by water scarcity and food insecurity. U.S. ground troops have joined the fight in northeast Syria to retake control of a prison that's been seized by fighters from the so-called ISIL. The prison houses thousands of its suspected members. SNBC in the UAE issued on Wednesday an alert warning the country of possible new missile or drone attack that may have occurred in Abu Dhabi on the 9th of February. It is a note that the United States warning to its citizens came after a media report states that the alert may have been triggered by a gas explosion in a building in downtown Abu Dhabi today, with the law enforcement fearing a possible terror attack. A group of Palestinian citizens were killed in the car in the occupied city of Nablus. They were murdered in the car by eight bullets shot from the Zionist soldiers because they were accused of committing crimes against the Zionist soldiers. More in this report. Zionist soldiers heinously carrying out a raid on innocent Palestinians. A group of Palestinian citizens were killed in their car in the occupied city of Nablus. They were murdered in their car by 80 bullets shot from the Zionist soldiers because they were accused of committing crimes against the Zionist soldiers. According to witnesses, these undercover troops used a taxi with a Palestinian license plate, pulled up near to a car and opened fire. Citizens of the area reacted in anger and gathered later to support the victims' families. One says that he is not only sad about this crime, but about the entire situation Palestine had been through since decades. And they have to act in response. I'm really sad, not only for this crime, but for the entire situation Palestine has been going through for decades. Some simply mentioned that they got used to such attacks. We're used to these crimes, but we must act in response. I'm really sad. We're filled with anger. No one is helping out. Meanwhile, Amnesty International stated earlier this month in a new study that the Zionists were committing apartheid against Palestinians and that it must be held accountable for treating them as an inferior racial category. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo has sworn in his fourth cabinet since the replacing the latest prime minister who lasted three days on the job. The latest reorganization comes amid continued internal struggles within the government that have defined the left-wing leader's first month as president. Castillo has also faced attacks from far-right opposition groups who have sought the situation. South Korea on Wednesday reported nearly 500, or let me say, 50,000 new COVID-19 cases, a new record driven by the highly contagious Omicron variant of coronavirus. According to the Korea Disease Control and Peruvian Agency, during the past 24 hours, 49,567 new cases were confirmed, pushing the total escalated to over 1.3 million, said. 
The Peruvian daily high was 38,000 infections on Sunday. As many as 21 more fatalities took the death toll to 6,943, while 1,000 more patients were admitted to hospitals. For two years now, the COVID-19 has disrupted daily lives and has occupied a large part of the media space. The presidential election in France and Hungary, with their different strategies to fight the virus, need to manage to find a place between a Macron, the vaccine pass, as well as the health protocol. Hassan Broken has more to explain. Protests against mandatory vaccinations and restrictions for the unvaccinated are being held weekly in Europe, and their influence on politics is beginning to increase, especially in France and Hungary. In the short term, some anti-vax movements are already influencing elections, but this could backfire in the French presidential elections as Emmanuel Macron has been playing the card of blaming the unvaccinated for the continuation of the pandemic. Some experts consider it a strategically wise move by Macron because all public polling in France suggests that the vast majority, more than two-thirds of the French people, support him in this tough line against the unvaccinated anti-vaxxers. In the upcoming Hungarian parliamentary elections campaign, Prime Minister Viktor Orban is following a completely different strategy. According to polls, 30% of the country's adult population refused any vaccine, and more than 50% oppose mandatory vaccinations. Hungary's government does not want to repel this large group of voters, so it has instead opted for a relatively relaxed set of anti-COVID measures. Most European countries are now well prepared for regular anti-vax demonstrations, but this is not the case when it comes to their impact on politics. As anti-vaccine mandate protesters continue to gum on downtown Ottawa, many are wondering how long police will let protesters stay and how they might eventually move them out. Why many residents have been calling for an end to the noise and disruption caused by the administration, Ottawa police chief Peter slowly has asked for more policing resources from all three levels of government. The busiest land crossing from the United States to Canada remained shut on Tuesday after Canadian truckers blocked lands on Monday to protest their government's pandemic control measures. Canadian protesters have embedded uh, access to the busiest international crossing in North America again, Tuesday escalating tensions as frustration of the administration against COVID-19 rules continues to roll the nation. Travel restrictions have started to ease after the last strict measure imposed on travelers entering the EU due to COVID-19 highly transmissible strain. Ahead of Mediterranean holiday, double doubled people will not have to go through self-isolation and testing measures, and they will only be required to present negative tests. Holiday bookings are experiencing a surge ahead of COVID travel tests being scrapped, making it a real possibility to go abroad without having to take a single test this February half term. More European countries could scrap tests for fully vaccinated arrivals in the coming days. France has revealed plans to drop its requirement for vaccinated UK travellers to show proof for a negative COVID test on arrival. Still a little bit scary. I always keep a mask on me still anyway. Um, but it's a massive relief because it's been, what, nearly two years? And being trapped inside or being restricted outside, it's just been exhausting, um, especially for someone my age. The change will most likely be rolled out in the European Union for fully vaccinated arrivals from outside the bloc. Speaking on Tuesday, France's Europe Minister Clément Bonne stated that the change would be announced in the coming days, but did not give details on the exact date. Portugal has recently announced that British visitors no longer require evidence for a pre-departure test upon arrival, as long as they are fully vaccinated. EU countries agreed on January 25th to better coordinate their travel rules for tourists crossing borders. It's um, strange. I feel like it's a little bit too soon, actually. Um, I'm from Edinburgh and we still wear masks, so it is a bit odd to see people not wearing masks in London. The move is a major boost for holidaymakers hoping to get away during the school half-term break in February. It comes as France joined Spain and Denmark last week by changing vaccine rules requiring anyone who completed their jabs more than nine months ago to have a booster to enter. 
I caused more paperwork and border delays have been the only detectable impact so far of Brexit from British businesses. Leaving the EU was supposed to give firms headroom to maximize their productivity and contribution to the economy, but instead has landed them with border holdups and red tape. The highest court in Ecuador ruled last week that indigenous communities in the country should have a stronger say over extractive projects like old drilling and mining that affect their ancestors' lands. Hussein Brukan. Chirangui, Ecuador, a small indigenous community in Ecuador's Amazon region, won a major court victory granting it authority to block extractive concessions. Sinangui, located in the vast eastern province of Pastatha and made up of some 50 families from the Aikofen ethnic group, has spent years trying to fight back against the government's violation on its ancestral land. According to Alejandra Narvaez, Shinangua Indigenous Patrol, defining territorial boundaries is a crucial step in protecting land that has been passed down for generations. We also have the right to protect, care for and patrol our territory, to identify the most impacted areas, to tell the state enough, enough contamination, enough of putting our territories in danger. That Amazon community, which lives sustainably on the banks of the Aguarico River, has been asserting its land title claims before different government entities. The Aikovan argue that the government stripped away much of its ancestral territory without consent in 1971 when it created the Kayambi Coca National Park, an ecological reserve that includes both high-altitude Sierra and the hot, humid rainforest of the Amazon Basin. We began going to the capital, to the mining ministry, to see what was happening, and we discovered that the government had approved 52 mining concessions for 25 years. There was never any consultation, nothing. The ICOFON has launched a program with organizations such as Amazon Frontline and Alienta Cable that is aimed at mapping their entire ancestral land at the headwaters of the Aguarico River. Muslim students have taken it to the Indian streets due to the ban on Islamic headscarves, uh, which they claim is an attack on their belief, which is protected by the Indian constitution. On the other hand, Hindu right-wing groups have attempted to prevent Muslim women from entering educational institutions, causing public conflict. Islam Seed has more to tell. After a debate over the hijab that has attracted international attention, an India state has closed high schools and universities. Six adolescent students at a government-run pre-university college in Karnataka, Udupi County, began protesting after being excluded from school lessons for wearing a headscarf. And we will fight for our uh, last, uh, last minute of our life and this is for us and this is for our community and this is for our all Indian citizens, our citizenship right. Muslim students have been outraged by the ban on Islamic headscarves, which they said is an attack on their faith and it is protected by India's constitution. On the other hand, Hindu right-wing groups have attempted to prevent Muslim women from entering educational institutions causing communal strife. Right when the college started, they could have said that we are not leaving you to wear hijab in this college. Uh, then we would have not joined here. Now we would go for other college where hijab is allotted. Right? Why, did they, why didn't they uh, say it as uh, beginning? Why did they start it now? On Tuesday, police used tear gas to disperse a throng at a government-run institution, while a large police presence was visible at schools in targeted towns. Last week, local media reported that numerous schools in the coastal city of Adupi had refused access to Muslim girls wearing the hijab, citing an instruction from the educational ministry eliciting outrage from parents and students. When uh, India is giving a right to follow a religion and their, uh, this constitution itself giving a right to do it, then why they are stopping us to do all those things? Uh? On Twitter, the state's chief minister has encouraged students and others to keep peace and unity. Two petitions have been filed on behalf of the protesters. One urges that the right to choose what to dress is guaranteed under India's constitution. The other questions the legitimacy of a recent state government dress code, order for educational institutions which bans headscarves and hijabs. Opposition parties and opponents accuse the BGP-led federal and state governments of discriminating against religious minorities. 
Sri Lanka health workers launched an indefinite strike as starting from Monday protesting the government's failure to address salary anomalies and other issues. Health workers in Sri Lanka have been participating in an intensive industrial action over the past three months. The major demands include the rectifi rectification of salary anomalies, higher allowances for transport and on call duties from 3,000 rupees to 10,000 rupees almost 50 US dollar and increase in overtime rates. Thousands of Argentines marched through the streets of Buenos Aires on Tuesday to protest against a likely deal with International Monetary Fund to revamp more than $40 billion of debt that the country cannot pay back. Osama Yedi has more to tell. Several thousand protesters marched in Buenos Aires on Tuesday to denounce the agreement reached between the government of the center-left, President Alberto Fernandez, and the IMF on the repayment of $44 billion loan. Activists from about 200 movements and associations gathered in front of the Casa Rosada, the pink governmental palace. The Fernandez government must remember Argentina's history. All the agreements with the IMF since 1983 have brought chaos, ended in structural adjustment, hyperinflation and a huge social crisis. On January 28, the Argentina president announced a new repayment deal with the International Monetary Fund for a $44 billion loan granted in 2018 to the government of his predecessor, Mauricio Macri. Under the new deal, Argentina has committed to progressively reducing its fiscal deficit from 3% in 2021 to just 0.9% in 2024. It is uh, a, a historic negotiation and it will, uh, to, to a large extent, uh, determine the, the face that the IMF uh, will have in the next few years in a world that is full of problems, in a world that is evolving, and in which multilateralism needs to evolve, and the IMF also needs to evolve. The agreement still has to be ratified by Congress, where the ruling coalition has the largest grip but does not have the majority. The government hopes to define the terms of the new financing program before the March 22nd deadline, when $2.85 billion must be repaid by Argentina, which cannot afford it. After the last protests erupted in the streets of Argentina, hundreds of associations are against the deal, or let me say, the last deal of the Argentina government and the IMF, as lower class is expected to be more affected or the economy may witness a superinflation. More in the support. Argentina and the IMF announced a breakthrough in late January to revamp a failed 2018 loan, reassuring that the agreement will not affect social spendings or economic growth of the working class. Vilma Ripoll, another FIT leader, stated that the deal has nothing to do with the needs of Argentinians, but with the illegitimate and unpayable debt. The deal is in the progress of negotiation, as the government knows they can't pay the debt. This is going to happen again in two years' time. We can't pay back this amount of money without affecting the poorest. The poorest. Argentinian people are hoping this protest would lead to a middle ground that benefits them and their day-to-day -day salary. Poverty also remains high, affecting 40% of the population, which means the agreement still has to be ratified by the Argentinian Congress. Inflation is affecting all commercial business. The prices are constantly changing. U.S. dollar is increasingly rising, which affects the transport. It is scary and paralyzing. We want this uncertainty to stop for good. Argentina's inflation rate has been among the highest in the world for the past five years. And it still remains very high considering the average annual household income per capita reached around 3,000 US dollars in December 2020. In 2021, inflation was around 50.9%, while it is forecast to be 33% in 2022. And now for more international news and updates, let's follow this roundup by Zaha Frujani. Libya's parliament is set to designate a new prime minister to rule the transitional government on Thursday, raising concerns over the possibility of a new power struggle. The effort to replace interim prime minister Abdul Hamid Debeba comes after the date for Libya's first presidential election, scheduled for December 24 last year, came and went during his watch. Sri Lanka's central bank has said that the country is committed to honoring all forthcoming debt obligations and that the island nation is not on the edge of a sovereign default.
Sri Lanka is facing its worst financial crisis in decades, and foreign exchange reserves have fallen to $2.36 billion, according to data from Sri Lanka's central bank. Activists in Indonesia claim that after the implementation of an argumentative mining law in 2020, there has been an upsurge in arrests of people protesting against mining operations. They've signaled out that the law's Article 162, which states that anyone who hinders or disturbs mining activities may be punished with a maximum prison term of one year and maximum fines of $7,000. On Oklahoma City's northwest side, a five-alarm fire that could be seen for miles raised Tuesday evening. According to a sign on the front of the structure, after 7 p.m. the department complex have been exploded by the fire. In the United States, Starbucks Company fired several employees involved in organizing a union in Memphis on Tuesday. The coffee giant said that the employees violated company policy by reopening a store after closing time and inviting non-employees to come inside and move throughout the store, including behind the counter and in back rooms. Back to the United States, where a couple has been arrested and charged with conspiring to launch $4.5 billion in stolen cryptocurrency funds, of which law enforcement officials have seized $3.6 billion at their initial appearances in federal court in Manhattan on Tuesday afternoon. U.S. Judge Debra Freeman set bound at $8 million for the couple and demanded that the parents post their homes as security for their return to court. The department has charged Ilya Lichtenstein and Heather Morgan for their alleged roles in a conspiracy to launder stolen cryptocurrency taken during the 2016 hack of a virtual currency exchange. That hack resulted in the theft of almost 120,000 Bitcoin, which at the time was worth approximately $71 million. Today, the value of that Bitcoin has grown to over $4.5 billion. Rising tensions on the Russia-Ukraine border have raised fears that, Europe's, that Europe's gas supply crisis could become far more serious. The tension showed that the risk of Europe's reliance on Russia for energy, which supplies about one-third of the continent's natural gas. Nabil Khazini. In Europe, fears of a possible Russian invasion of Ukraine spark other concerns over the continent's gas supplies. Russia is Europe's largest supplier of gas, of which a third flows through Ukraine's gas pipelines to continue across the continent. But are there alternative supplies? I think there are only three other options in the uh, short to mid term. The first one is basically uh, using the gas storage uh, facilities, so basically the gas stocked in the in the in the storage facilities, which in the current situation might probably help us to overcome the winter months but at a very high price because the storage facilities are emptier than uh, in, in, in the past years. Another solution for Europe could be liquefied gas. However, the problem with this alternative is that there are few suppliers across the world. The United States and Qatar could be one of them. The Qataris indeed did supply Europe with a lot more gas in the past, but given the fact that the Europeans were not very fond of the way that the contracts were structured, Qatar pivoted to Asia and now supplies for most of the gas to them rather than the Europeans. Should there be some, say, reconsideration on the European end when it comes to the contractual elements? No one knows for sure, but a complete shutoff is seen as unlikely because it would be mutually destructive. Moscow relies on energy exports, so Europe is a key source of revenue. As I already said, we are acting together, we are absolutely united and we will not taking different steps, we will do the same steps and they will be very, very hard to Russia and they should understand. Geopolitically speaking, the West shares a common view on the action that will be taken, among them cutting Nord Stream 2, should Russia invade Ukraine. On the other hand, Moscow has not signaled that they would consider cutting supplies in the case of new sanctions. A prominent scientist said on Tuesday that the discovery of the Emako mutant in white tail deer in New York raises fears that the type of deer, which numbers about 30 million in the United States, may be in combating a new strain of the coronavirus. Blood samples and some nasal swabs 
which include 131 deer caught on the Staten Island in New York, revealed the presence of the antibodies to the virus in about 50% of them. On Tuesday, Doc Western, the power of the dog, nominated the Field of Academy Award nominees with 12 nominations exceeding 10 nominations for the epic film done in the race for industry's highest award. They will compete against eight other films for the prestigious Best Picture Award in the 94th Academy Awards. Islam Seed has more to tell. 25 years since our first run together. 1900 and nothing. Netflix The Power of the Dog led nominees for the 94th Academy Awards or the Oscars with 12 nominations. Ahead of the next month's Oscars Gala, the film about a repressed 1920s cattle rancher in Montana received 12 nominations, including Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress and Best Director, making Campion the first female auteur nominated twice in Academy Award history who was last nominated 28 years ago for the piano. Dune is science fiction picture produced by Warner Bros. came in second with 10 nominations, followed by West Side Story, a musical romance drama film, and Belfast, a comedy drama film, each with seven nominations. The six other Best Picture nominees are Coda, Don't Look Up, Drive My Car, King Richard, Licorice Pizza and Nightmare Alley. This Hollywood award season, the Japanese movie Drive My Car is a favorite, having been the first Japanese film to be nominated for Best Picture. The film also will compete against Flea from Denmark, The Head of God from Italy, Lunana Iyak in the Classroom from Bhutan, and The Worst Person in the World from Norway, in the category of Best International Feature Film, formerly known as Best Foreign Language Film. According to a news release from the organization, from March 17 through March 22, active members of the Academy can vote for the winners in all categories. The 94th Academy Awards will be placed on March 27 at the Dolby Theater in Hollywood, California, in the United States. Unless you get in the swing of things. Chelsea star has declared his decision to step down from international football duty following a long-term falling out of Morocco's coach Vaid Halilzic finalist. Hakim Ziyech, the 28 years old, was left out of the national squad chosen to participate in the Afghan 2021 in Cameroon last month and with Halilzi suggesting he had no intention of selecting the attacker for the World Cup, Cup qualification playoffs against uh, Democratic Republic of Congo in March. Ziyech has decided finally to close that chapter of his career. I understand them, but uh, I will not return to the national team. It's final and, uh, decision? Yeah, it's my final decision. and uh, It's all clear for me how things are going over there. And, and, you know, it's all clear for me and I'm focusing on what I'm doing. And that's right now my club and did everything. Feel, did you feel bad after the decision of the coach? Of course. Who doesn't? But on the end of the day, uh, you know, it's a decision he makes and, uh, you know, it's, you have to respect it. But on the end, uh, if all the lying comes comes with it, it's for me clear. And then, like I said before, I will not return to the national team. Working at Hassan Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Damiba was in the reception of the national football team returning from the 33rd African Cup of Nations in Cameroon. The delegation, led by the president of the Burkina B Football Federation, Lazar Bansi, presented to the head of the state the results of Burkina Faso's participation in this competition. Lieut Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry congratulated the team players for that journey, saying the hearts of the Burkina vibrates for what they have done. You have given us a lot of joy. You have also given us a lot of disappointment. Men built on his mistake and his failures. The result of the last match is bitter, but it is up to us to swallow it in order to move forward. To this point, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a reminder over our main stories. European leaders pledge unity in their goal of averting war on the continent, as France's President Emmanuel Macron said that he saw a path forward 
on his intention with Russia over Ukraine. U.S. President Joe Biden's nominee to be the top U.S. military general for the Middle East. Michael Corilla expressed his concern over what he sees as a strong role for the so-called ISIL and Al-Qaeda. Sri Lanka health workers launched an indefinite strike protesting the government's failure to address salary anomalies and other issues. In Argentina, thousands have marched through the streets of Buenos Aires protests against the likely deal with the International Monetary Fund to revamp more than $40 billion of debt that the country cannot pay back. That's all what we have got for today's bulletin. Thank you so much for being with us. See you tomorrow and have a blessed evening.